So we're going to start the next unit with a little chemistry joke. There it is. Hope you enjoyed it. So we're still on page five in our chapter four notes. Now we're going to look at the Bohr model, which you should have learned about in physical science class. Okay, so make sure that you're following along, highlighting and drawing the pictures that I also draw on the board. So the Bohr model, the atom, he was the first guy that came up with electron orbits or energy levels. Remember that before Bohr, Rutherford said that there was a small, dense, positively charged nucleus and the electrons were just kind of flying around somewhere and he wasn't sure where they were or how exactly they were arranged. So here's what Bohr discovered. Bohr discovered that electrons can circle the nucleus only in a loud path or orbits at certain energies. It's really important that we look at that word orbits. That's a key vocab word for this section. The energy of the electron is greater when it, um, when it is in orbits farther away from the nucleus. The atom achieves the ground state when atoms occupy the closest possible positions around the nucleus. And then here's an important point that we talked about when we watched the video a couple days ago. Electromagnetic radiation is emitted when electrons move closer to the nucleus. So when they go down to a ground state, they emit energy. The energy is a photon or a packet or a quanta of energy with the equation E equals H nu. We used that equation in the previous videos when we were solving for the energy of those specific photons. Looking at energy transitions, energies of atoms are fixed and definite in their quantity. We can solve for them algebraically like we did above. Energy transitions occur in jumps of discrete or exact amounts of energy. And electrons only lose energy when they move to a lower energy state. So here's a picture of all of the energy transformations that happen with the hydrogen atom. If you look at your periodic table, you're going to find that hydrogen's atomic number is 1. Atomic number 1, that means there is only one proton, which means there is also in turn only one electron. So this one electron, you can make it do all these different jumps based on how much energy you um, throw at the atom. So this electron can jump all the way up to the seventh orbital and it can fall all the way down to the first orbital and give off this specific energy. Don't worry too much about what all these are named and what they mean. I'm just showing that there are only certain paths the electron can take. The key takeaway for this part is that if there's higher energy, there's going to be a high frequency and there's going to be a low wavelength. Remember we saw on the previous page that high energy light are things like blue and purple, while lower energy lights um, are things like orange and red, and they have a low frequency but a very larger wavelength. So keeping that in mind, what has more energy, red or violet light? So which one from the previous page had more energy? Look back to your algebra, and we see that violet has a lot more energy. So our answer would be the violet light. It has a higher energy when you solve for it algebraically, and it also has a higher frequency. Looking at what has more energy, UV or visible, well, if you look at your handout that I gave you in class the other day, especially in your homework, I think on page two or three, UV light has an even higher frequency than visible light. This is why if you're out in the sun too long, you can get sunburns. So UV light has the higher energy because it has um, also a higher frequency. If you need more review on this, look back at your homework packet, pages one, two, and three. So this is what Bohr thought, and Bohr made a lot of important contributions, but he wasn't exactly correct. A few years after Bohr, we developed the quantum model of the atom. This is the current model we use today, and it gives us a much more accurate picture of what is actually going on. So if we want to go through and look at how the model of the atom evolved through time, Democritus and Dalton, they thought the atom was solid spheres. And I thought, okay, maybe they can combine in these definite whole number ratios, like if you're making H2O, it would look something like that, and you can make other combinations. Thompson thought, no, it was more of a plum pudding model, where there's small negative plums, or electrons actually, in a positive pudding matrix. Rutherford came along, he said, well, I know there's a tiny nucleus and it's positive, but the electrons are just kind of like zooming around somewhere outside the nucleus. And he didn't know exactly where they were, or why they stayed in those orbits. Um, let's add one other note. Let's actually draw a picture for Bohr. So we're going to add, we had A, B, C, D. Let's draw Bohr over here. He said, yes, there is that small, dense, positively charged nucleus. 
and then the electrons exist on very specific certain rings. So he had all of these energy levels that stacked up around the nucleus. So he said actually he found that there were seven different energy levels, and that's because he saw these seven different transitions in the hydrogen atom. So I'll draw a couple more circles here. Good. And then that's going to bring us to um, what Planck and Einstein said and eventually to Schrodinger. So to get to from the Bohr model to the quantum model, we had to fundamentally change our understanding of physics. Planck, he thought that light could be thought of as discrete packets of energy, quantum. Scientists had known that it was a particle and a wave. And then Einstein, um, he did the photoelectric effect experiment, and he found that you can think of light as both waves and particles. So we knew this about light, and then the big breakthrough was that this also is true of electrons. So if we look at the Bohr model, um, he took those electrons, put them on rings, and he said that electrons can gain or lose energy, lose electrons, um, well, this is a typo right here. Electrons can gain or lose, not electrons, we need to change that. Electrons can gain or lose energy. They can gain or lose energy by changing orbits. He said that electrons are only found in the specific circular paths or orbits around the nucleus, just like the solar system. And the important word is quantum. That's the amount of energy required to move an electron from one energy level to another. And that's one photon, one packet of light. This was really great and it solved a lot of the problems that um, early scientists had identified. However, his model only worked for the hydrogen atom. It broke down when they tried to apply it to larger atoms. So there must be more to what was actually going on to account for the rest of these phenomena they observed. And that brings us to the quantum mechanical model. Rutherford and Bohr accounted for the paths that electrons took. Um, then Louis de Broglier came around and he was looking at the electrons and their wave-like properties. He considered the electron as a wave confined to a space that can have only certain frequencies. So the truest way to think about an electron is to visualize like a small vibrating string, like a guitar string, confined to an infinitesimally small piece of space. So it's like a particle, but that particle is a tiny, tiny wave that is stuck. The next guy that came around and was looking at electrons was Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg, he came up with his famous uncertainty principle in 1927. He said that it is impossible to determine simultaneously both the, both the position and velocity of an electron or any other particle. I've got another chemistry joke for you if you want to see this one. So let's see. Where's another chemistry joke? Here it is. So are electrons having a self-identity crisis? So that's your little um, Heisenberg joke for you. Um, and then he said electrons are located by their interactions with photons. So that's how we actually discover them in labs. We throw photons at them, but by doing that, we actually change the properties of the electrons because they are so similar in size and in energy. So those interactions between the photon and the electron knock the electron off its course, and that's why you can't figure out where it is and how fast it's moving at the same time. You can figure out one, but by measuring one, you change the other variable. And that brings us to Schrodinger. Schrodinger is our, our most important guy in recent history. He proved the quantization of electron energies as, and it is the basis of his quantum theory. This is the leading theory we look at today. Quantum theory describes mathematically the wave properties of electrons and other very, very small particles. Electrons do not move around the nucleus in planetary orbits. Bohr was wrong about that. It's actually much more complicated. Electrons exist in dense regions called orbitals. This is your other key vocab word. Make sure you know that Schrodinger came up with the word orbitals, while Bohr, he was looking at orbits. So these orbitals are a dense three-dimensional region of space around the nucleus that indicate the probable location of an electron. Schrodinger did a whole bunch of math, and here is just an example of the equation he used. It's pretty complicated, but don't worry, we won't go into all that calculus-based math but we will use the results of his mathematical expression. So atomic orbitals, these are actually the solutions to his equation, and they give us the energies that an electron can have. These are called energy levels. What Bohr discovered with the orbits, those are actually Schrodinger's energy levels. For each energy level, the Schrodinger equation also leads to a mathematical expression called an atomic orbital, which is what we just talked about, describing the probability of finding an electron at various locations around the nucleus. 
So here is what this actually means. An atomic orbital, that's the region of space where you can find the electron, and it is divided into energy sublevels with different um, orbital shapes. The orientation of the orbital around the nucleus. So there are um, actually four different types of orbitals. The first one is the S orbital. It's a sphere. Try and imagine turning a sphere. Is there any way you can turn a sphere where it isn't a sphere? No. So there's only really one way you can orient a sphere. The P orbital is this kind of dumbbell shape. And if you turn it in 3D space, you could orient it around the X axis, along the Y axis, or along the Z axis. That's the third dimension. We also have a D orbital, which has five different orientations I'm showing here. And there's also an F orbital, which is a little bit too complicated to draw. It's too complicated to draw, but here is an illustration of what all those orbitals look like. So these are all different paths that electrons could take around the nucleus, but these are all superimposed or stacked on top of each other. So in the end, the electron cloud looks kind of just like a scrambled, a scrambled mess. Let's go back to the notes. Here is what you need to know. This chart is a little bit confusing, but this tells you everything you need to know about electron configurations. So Bohr came up with the principal quantum number, kind of. He was thinking those are the rings. Schrodinger um, refined that, and here's an analogy. I want you to think of, like, if you're going on vacation with your family and you're staying in a hotel. This hotel has four floors. First floor, second floor, third floor, and fourth floor. On the first floor, there is one apartment or one room, and it only has one bedroom. And that bedroom can hold two people. And so when that relates to electrons, the first energy level has the S orbital, that's the sphere, and that sphere has one orientation and it can hold up to two electrons. The second floor of our hotel has two different apartments. There's a second S orbital, which has one room and can hold two people. And then there's a P apartment, which has three bedrooms and can hold six people. So on the second floor of our hotel, there can be up to eight people. Going to the electron example, this means that there are, there's one orientation of the S orbital and it can hold up to two electrons. And the p orbital occurs in three different planes and can hold up to six electrons for eight electrons on the second ring. This is how you drew electrons in physical science last. You put two on the first ring, eight on the second ring, 18 on the third ring, and 32 on the fourth ring. Let's go to the third floor of our hotel. This time, the third floor has an S apartment, a P apartment, and a D apartment. The S apartment is one bedroom, holds two people. The P apartment is a three bedroom, holds six people. And the D apartment has five bedrooms and can hold up to 10 people for 18 people living on the third floor. Or in terms of electrons, S orbital has two electrons, P orbital holds up to six electrons, and D orbital holds up to 10 electrons. Add those all up and you get 18 electrons on the third energy level. And then the fourth floor of the hotel. Now we have four different apartments, like before the S has one bedroom, two people, the P apartment has three bedrooms, hold up to six people, and the D apartment has five bedrooms, holding up to 10 people, and the F apartment, Super Deluxe has seven different bedrooms and can hold up to 14 people for a total of 32 people living on the fourth floor. Looking at the electron example then, there can be up to 32 electrons on that fourth energy level arranged in these different orbital paths. If you try and visualize this in your mind, we have to superimpose and stack all of these up. So closest to the nucleus, there are two electrons. Going out another level, there are eight electrons. Another level out, there's 18. And another level out, there are 32. So you want to picture all of these stacked in your head with all these electrons zooming around. And what this ends up is when we actually look at what a good model of the atom would look like, it's basically a big buzzing cloud of electrons. They are following all these different really crazy paths. And then there's a really, really tiny, dense, positive nucleus in the center. This is actually the best representation of an atom that we have. Um, we're going to go into some of the periodic trends later. But I want you to make sure, if you found any of that confusing, which it, it was a lot, make sure you go back and reread your notes and check out some of the extra videos I posted on Google Classroom. Bye, guys.